Hi, class. Well, uh, welcome back for the second part of the lecture. Uh, so we started uh, earlier today talking about what it's going to take to really try and look for life elsewhere in the universe. And we said there were two parts to that question. The first part was defining what it is we're actually looking for, defining what life is. And then the second part was really estimating, trying to figure out how hard the search is going to be, which in some ways boils down to trying to figure out how much life there might be in the universe so we know how hard we have to look, okay? And so we had settled on that one way to answer the second part of that question was the Drake equation. And so we're gonna talk about the Drake equation and show how we're gonna use it uh, here in this part of the lecture, okay? So let me start sharing the slides for this section. So uh, the Drake equation is very often, uh, or more often than not, presented in the search for extraterrestrial intelligence. Um, in this case, we're going to use it not to look for intelligent alien life, but just use it to estimate what we would have to do to find any life at all, okay? Uh, we will come back to it many times over this quarter, and in fact, near the end of the quarter, when we start talking about the search for extraterrestrial intelligence, uh, we'll use it in the way that it's kind of normally demonstrated in the way that you've normally seen it, okay? But today, we'll introduce the basics, um, and we'll come back to it, and we'll use it again uh, when we need to, okay? So we'll talk about the Drake equation in its full form. I'll kind of show you what it is. We'll talk about how we're going to modify the Drake equation or how you can modify it for your own devious purposes. Um, and then we'll use it for the first time today. Okay, so that'll be the scope of what we do. So the Drake equation, quite surprisingly, is named after radio astronomer Frank Drake. So Frank uh, was born here in Chicago in 1930. Uh, he's still alive. He's 89 years old now. Uh, he did his undergraduate work at the University of Illinois, uh, and he did his graduate work at Harvard, and after he got his PhD, uh, he went to work at the National Radio Astronomy Observatory in 1958. Now, the main site for the National Radio Astronomy, Tor Radio Astronomy Observatory at that time is in Green Bank, West Virginia. They're still there. Uh, but it was a remote location that was far away from the burgeoning uh, amount of radio, television, electricity, all of those things that were going on in the world at that time. And so the U.S. government, uh, at the behest of the scientific community, set up a radio quiet zone, which still exists in West Virginia. And at the center of it, they put the first National Radio Astronomy Observatory. So Frank went to work there in 1958, and he did many things in his career. Uh, you see him standing here in front of the 85-foot telescope. Uh, this telescope is the baseline telescope in an instrument that is now known as the Green Bay Interferometer. It's no longer operational, uh, but this telescope was there when Frank arrived, and uh, he used it for many, many things. So he was the very first person to observe and map out uh, the center of the Milky Way. That work laid the groundwork for the discovery of the supermassive black hole that we now know lives at the center of the Milky Way called Sagittarius A star. Uh, he was the first person to discover that the uh, planet Jupiter has radiation belts just like the Earth does. So the Earth's magnetic field has these belts called the Van Allen radiation belts. They were discovered by the first US satellite called Explorer. Uh, and they were predicted by James Van Allen at the University of Iowa. And they're basically places where the Earth's magnetic field traps radiation, uh, radiated particles, uh, and is one of the things that keeps you and I from uh, being exposed to deadly cosmic rays all the time. Uh, he also, uh, Frank also, was the first person to discover that Venus is the same temperature on the day side and the night side, and that temperature is hot. Okay, and so he discovered that with radio astronomy, um, and uh, this is the primary evidence for the greenhouse effect, or was the early primary evidence for the runaway greenhouse effect on Venus. And that's a topic we'll come back to uh, a bit later in the course when we talk about the habitability of planets. Now, in 1959, he embarked on one of his most ambitious projects. Frank was always interested in the search for extraterrestrial intelligence, and so he figured out a way and uh, began an experiment to use the 85-foot telescope there to search for possible signals from alien civilizations. 
It was the first uh, robust search for uh, communications from extraterrestrial intelligences that was ever carried out. Uh, and it really started Frank uh, on his long career in SETI and, and astrobiology and kind of set the stage for this field. So Frank really was the uh, grandfather of this field. Um, and he was one of the very first, uh, very first people uh, to conduct serious scientific research along these lines. Now, because uh, OSMA, so OSMA, Project OSMA did not detect any signals. I think most of you know we have never detected a verifiable alien signal from uh, outer space. Uh, but uh, it really kind of got people thinking about this. And so in 1961, Frank held um, a conference at the NRAO uh, to discuss the ideas and the challenges and the things we needed to think about in order to conduct a proper search for extraterrestrial life. Okay, so the, uh, the kind of most famous outcome of that conference was indeed the Drake Equation. And the reason the equation came about um, is that Frank was looking at the agenda, the series of talks that he had arranged for all his colleagues to give at the conference, and he realized that if you look at the topic of each talk, it could be reduced to a single number that told you something about the universe. Okay, and he realized that if you multiply all of those numbers together, what comes out is the number of possible extraterrestrial civilizations in the Milky Way galaxy. Okay, so, so the idea, that realization led directly to this equation, um, and we'll talk about, uh, about the validity of the equation here um, in a little bit. Um, I forgot to put a picture of it here in the lecture, but if you go visit the NRAO, which you can do when you're not in quarantine, as we all are now, uh, you can visit what's called the Drake Lounge. It's the little conference room where they had the, uh, had the original conference, and there's a plaque on the wall that has uh, the, uh, the Drake equation on it, okay? So what are the seven numbers that go into the Drake equation, okay? So the output the eighth number, the last number, the output, is the number of extraterrestrial civilizations in the galaxy. And so how do you get that? You need to multiply seven numbers together. The first number is called R star. It's the rate of star formation in the Milky Way galaxy. How many stars are born each year in the Milky Way? That is, in principle, a uh, measurable quantity. You just ask astronomers to go out and use their telescopes and watch the whole galaxy and just tell us how many stars are born in it. Okay. The second number is usually called FP, and it is the fraction of stars which have planets around them. Okay. Now, as I like to remind people, uh, at the time that Frank and his colleagues were talking about this in the early 1960s, there was only one star that we knew had planets around, it, and that's the sun. And that has been true all the way up until the 2000s. So it's only been in most of your lifetimes that we've actually known with certainty that there are other planets with stars around them, okay? We have always suspected that was true. Gene Roddenberry and George Lucas told us that was true. Uh, but scientists, astronomers, didn't know it was true. We suspected it, but we didn't know. It's only recently that we've been able to measure this and verify it, okay? The third number is usually called NE, or sometimes you'll see it written called NH. So this is basically the number of habitable planets that are around each star that has planets. Okay, now the reason it's usually called uh, NE is because in some, uh, some literature, uh, if you're reading scientific papers, this will sometimes be called the number of Earth-like worlds. Um, I think there is a current tendency in astrobiology to not use the word Earth-like. Um, but instead to use the word habitable, because Earth-like implies that we're very definitely looking for uh, life that looks like life here on Earth. If you're looking for a planet where you and I could go on vacation, then certainly we're looking for Earth-like worlds. But if we're just looking for life in general, um, we're looking for worlds that are habitable for life. So I'll usually call this the number of habitable worlds, okay? The... Fourth number is of all the planets that are habitable that exist, what fraction of those actually develop life at all? Okay, so we will eventually talk about habitable worlds, and certainly in our solar system, there are um, more potential worlds than just the Earth, which could be habitable, uh, but right now we only know of one of those worlds in our solar system that has life. So this fraction is only some of those planets that could be habitable 
could or may have life on them. Okay, and that's a number we have no idea what the value is right now. The last number, remember Frank and his uh, colleagues were thinking about yeah, intelligent life. The last number is of the fraction of planets that develop life, what fraction of those develop intelligent life? Okay, because if you want to talk to something, then presumably it's got to be intelligent, but it doesn't just pay to be intelligent. There's plenty of intelligent life on Earth. Uh, you also have to have technology. So the next number is the fraction of civilizations that develop technology capable of communicating across interstellar distances. And normally the way radio astronomers think about this is basically the civilization has to have the technology to build a radio telescope. Okay, so that's usually subscripted C. The C usually means communicative. That is, is the civilization capable of communicating over interstellar distances? Okay, and then finally the last number is capital L. It's basically the lifetime of the species in years. Okay, and as we will find in our studies, this number is probably the most contentious number. It has a lot of uh, possible variability with it, depending on how exactly you go about defining it. Today, we're going to define it in a very practical and eminently reasonable way, but when we come back to this in the discussion of intelligent life, we'll talk about some of the challenges about figuring out what capital L actually is. Okay, so that's it. That's the whole Drake equation. Those seven numbers, you figure out their values, you multiply them together, and you get n, the number of extraterrestrial civilizations you can talk to. Okay, but here's the point. You can basically break the Drake equation down into different parts. Yeah, it's just seven numbers, but if you group the seven numbers, each of the groupings tells you something different. Okay, and is related to some different body of knowledge that you are able to work out, go figure out, make observations to discover about the universe. Okay, so the first group of numbers are the first three numbers, and I usually call those the astrophysics numbers. Okay, so that's R star, the rate of star formation, FP, the fraction of stars with planets, and NH or NE, the number of habitable planets around any given star that has planets, okay? So I call that a little astrophysics because it's all about stars and planets, which has to do with star formation, the physics of stars, the physics of exoplanets, and so on, okay? And we're gonna talk about all of that this, this, this quarter, okay? The second grouping of numbers is actually the fourth number and the seventh number. This is the fraction of planets to develop life, and it's the length of time that that life exists on the planet. Okay, so those two numbers are directly related to the nature of life uh, in general. Not any specific characteristics of life, just is the life there and how long is it there, okay? And then the last grouping, these two numbers, Fi, the fraction of uh, intelligence and the fraction of communicative technology, those two numbers are really just about the intelligence part of the Drake equation. Okay, and so in this kind of grouping, it allows us to focus our attention and isolate what we care about to only the things that we're interested in at any given point in time. And so for our question today, where we're just asking, is there life anywhere? Okay, we don't care if it's intelligent or not. We just care if there's life. So we're gonna take the Drake equation and we're gonna keep the three numbers that have to do with astrophysics and the two numbers that have to do with life, and we're going to write it this way. So this is a modified Drake equation. It's five numbers, and it doesn't tell us anything about how many civilizations there are in the galaxy. It just tells us how much life, how many planets might there be with life on them throughout the Milky Way galaxy, which is what we want to know, because the question we're trying to answer is, is life common or not? Okay? So let's take these two, uh, these two sections in parts, okay? So let's start with the astrophysics part, okay? If I just look up uh, what astronomers know, none of these numbers were known in Frank's day, okay? But today, we know them pretty well. So our star, we know in the Milky Way galaxy, about six stars per year form. 
We get that number by looking at uh, stellar nurseries, by uh, looking at places like the Orion Nebula, which we showed a picture of during last lecture. We know there are stars forming in the Orion Nebula. We can count how many there are. We can count how many similar stellar nurseries there are uh, throughout the Milky Way galaxy. We know how long it takes a star to collapse out of that nebula and become a star. And so we can estimate that roughly six stars per year form in the Milky Way. Now, FP, the fraction of stars that develop planets, this is something that we have only recently discovered because we both only recently discovered that planets have stars around them, even though we long suspected it. Now, I think what we've discovered in just the last decade is that pretty much any time we go looking for planets, we find them around stars. And so these days, what I would guess most astronomers argue about is whether or not um, that FP is one or if it's less than one, okay? Now, in the interest of not being overtly optimistic, today what I'm gonna propose we do is we take that number to be half. Um, it seems very likely that every planet is going to have, uh, sorry, every star is going to have planets around it, in which case FP should be one. 100% of stars have planets around them. But in the interest of being conservative, let's just say there's a 50-50 chance that any given star will have planets around it. So we set FP to a half, okay? The last number, the number of habitable worlds, ME, um, I'm gonna take to be two. And the reason I'm gonna do that is if you look at our solar system, okay, and we'll come back to this uh, again. I know I keep promising that, but we're, we're kind of trying to get into the topic here. <laughs> Uh, if you look at our solar system, there's basically three worlds that sit in what is called the habitable zone. Okay, what is that? That is the distance from the star where there's enough energy from the star to maintain liquid water on the surface under a variety of conditions. Okay, so Earth, Venus, and Mars all live within that habitable zone. If you look at Earth, Venus, and Mars, Earth is the only one that you and I would call habitable. Venus has had a runaway greenhouse effect and certainly uh, we don't think can support life, at least life like we have here on Earth. And Mars's atmosphere has slowly been lost over the years uh, and is now too thin, uh, so Mars is very cold. And so it couldn't, as it is now, we don't think support at least Earth-like life the way we have it. Uh, there may still be uh, evidence that in the past Mars had life and we'll come back to that topic as well. Okay, so it's somewhere between one and three. So let's take two. That makes the math very easy. If I take R star, F, P, and N, E, all of the astrophysics terms multiplied together give me the number six. Okay, now if you're following along, you may be sitting there looking at this and have your own opinions about what some of those numbers may be. Okay, so maybe you think, you know, our star doesn't seem right, Larson. I read an article in National Geographic, and they said eight stars per year form, okay? And I really am not so sure that, you know, you chose the right number of habitable plants. That's fine, okay? This is what we call a Fermi problem. And a Fermi problem is a problem where you're using your best knowledge to put some values on the numbers. But the point is, is that your knowledge, while it's not certain, it's not terribly uncertain either. And so even if you change these numbers within ranges that you and I could argue about, we're gonna get something that's very close to what we originally started with, okay? So in particular, if I took eight stars per year and I said all three planets, Earth, Venus, and Mars, in principle could be habitable, and I multiply out the astrophysics term, I get 12, okay? And six and 12, they look far apart, in common everyday experience, they're far apart. If you're talking about things like uh, millions of dollars or you're talking about the number of pieces of Halloween candy you have, okay? But in astrophysics terms, they're only different by a factor of two, okay? And when we get very, all the way to the end of this calculation here, we'll talk about whether or not that factor of two is important or not, okay? So that's how the astrophysics bit of this calculation is going to go. So now let's talk about the hard thing. Let's talk about uh, the, uh, the life terms. Now, from last lecture, you will remember there's two basic extreme camps in terms of thinking about life. There is the people who believe in the principle of mediocrity, that life is probably common, and then there's people who believe in the rare earth hypothesis that uh, life is probably uncommon. Okay, so let's 
take both those viewpoints and see what the Drake equation tells us about how hard it's going to be to look for life in the universe. Okay, so the basic number uh, that expresses the principle of the media uh, of uh, mediocrity or the rarity hypothesis is FL, the fraction of planets that show life. Okay, so I could be overtly optimistic and say every planet uh, may develop life. Okay, if I did that, I would set FL to 1. 100% 1 of all planets that are habitable develop life. Okay, now I'm not going to be overtly optimistic today. I'm going to try and be a little conservative. Okay, and so I'm going to take that number to be 1 in 100. If I take all the habitable planets in the galaxy and I put them in a big pile, only one out of every hundred of those is going to have life on it. That's going to be my guess. Okay. Now, if you're a pessimistic person, if you believe in the rare earth hypothesis, then even one in a hundred planets is too many. Okay. So you may say, no, life is really, really, really uncommon. So it's only one in a million planets that are going to have life. I take that big pile of planets, I take one out, I throw a million away, and only that one has life on it. Okay, so that's the kind of difference that we're really talking about when we talk about the principle of mediocrity versus the rare earth hypothesis. Okay, okay, so the other number here is L, the lifetime. And so the question is, how do you figure out how long life is going to live on a given planet? Okay, we don't have any practical experience about this, and this certainly is why um, scientists argue about this number so much. But I'm going to propose a very straightforward and very simple number that we can use today for this, which is the following We know the age of the Earth, it's 4.543 billion years old. We know from the fossil record that very soon after the earth was born, life arose, okay? Why, how, that's another story for another time. But very soon after uh, the earth formed, life arose. We also know that the earth has seen five major extinction events, okay? And possibly we're in the sixth, that's likely related to humans, we can talk about that later in the quarter. But natural extinction events, there have been five in the history of the Earth, okay? And those extinction events are events where the entire diverse ecosystem on the planet collapses, 90, 95, 99% of all species on the planet die, and then life regrows, repopulates, uh, re-diversifies, and then fills all the ecological niches again, okay? So I'm gonna propose that the value we should use for capital L today is the age of the Earth divided by the number of extinctions the Earth has seen, okay? So I take 4.543 billion years, I divide it by five extinctions, and I get about 9.1 times 10 to the eight years. Nine, 910 million years. No, 91 million years. Nope, 910 million years, okay? So every 910 million years, there's an extinction event, okay? They're not evenly spaced like that, but for our purposes here, that's good enough. Okay, so now I know everything I need to know to calculate just the life part for both these two cases. And for the principle of mediocrity, if I take one over per hundred, I multiply it by 910 million years, I get uh, 9.1 times 10 to the eight. For the rare earth case, yeah, I get 9.1 times 10 to the two. Okay, so now I have everything I need to calculate all the different pieces of the Drake equation. So for people who believe in the principle of mediocrity, if I multiply six times 9.1 times 10 to the eight, I get that there are, in all likelihood, 5.5 billion worlds throughout the galaxy that harbor some form of life. Okay, that's pretty optimistic. That sounds optimistic, doesn't it? Okay, if I'm a rare earth person, okay, if I believe in the rare earth hypothesis, then I multiply this all together, I get that n is 550. In the 200 billion stars that fill the Milky Way, there are only 550 worlds that plausibly harbor life. Okay, so that's a big needle in a haystack problem, okay, that makes, that makes our life very difficult, okay. 
Now, looking at these two numbers, uh, this is a place where you can look at that factor of two that we talked about early on. Does the factor of two matter in the astrophysics? And what you see is maybe it does, maybe it doesn't, but in all likelihood, it doesn't matter that much. If I change 550 to 1,000, 1,000 and 550 are both really small compared to 200 and billion. Okay, if I change 5 billion to 10 billion, that's still roughly the same size compared to 200 billion. Okay, so it doesn't, it doesn't necessarily affect us that much if we, uh, if we argue a lot about that factor too. Okay, and we will come back to that idea over and over again is does our uncertainty matter? Well, how big is our uncertainty? Sometimes it matters, sometimes it doesn't. Okay, so that's the way we, we use the Drake equation. This really kind of defines very roughly what the boundaries of how hard this search for life is going to be, okay? And scientists know how hard this is. Um, we are working on it. And depending on where any given scientist falls in this spectrum, uh, it tells you basically how optimistic they are, uh, whether or not we're gonna discover life uh, in the galaxy or not. Now, the last thing I want to do is I want to talk about whether or not the Drake equation is valid. People often kind of fret over this because it's kind of, they're, they're afraid it's too simplistic. They're afraid that it's underestimating or overestimating uh, what, uh, what's actually going on. But the point is, is that if you think it's too simplistic, any one of the numbers in the Drake equation can be made more complicated. You can break it down into all the parts that go into making it. And as we've just shown, if you think the Drake equation is too complicated or not computing exactly what you uh, want, you can certainly restructure it. Okay, but Frank himself wrote about this because he gets asked this question all the time. So if you ever read his book, Is Anyone Out There? Uh, this is what he said about it. Okay, so at the time Frank wrote this equation, he didn't have any values for the numbers. Okay, but the point was, is the equation itself is completely straightforward. Okay, and that's what he's really saying in this quote. He says, sometimes people think the equation is highly speculative, but in fact, it's just the opposite. Since each phenomena it assumes to take place in the universe is an event, is a phenomena that already takes place. We see it happening and we know that it's happened at least once in the case of all the life terms here on earth. Okay, so that viewpoint is really what I think gives the Drake equation the longevity that it's have and the confidence that we have as astrobiologists to use it to make these kinds of estimates that you and I have just made. And we'll come back to it over and over again to check our thinking, to guide our thinking um, as we go through the quarter. Okay, so that is all I'm going to say for this lecture. Um, I hope you all are keeping up. If you have any questions, do put them into the discussion section on Canvas, and I will see you all soon. Okay, take care.